Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Arya Fala. I work as an assistant professor at the Department of Neurosurgery here at UCLA. And it's my great pleasure today to be here and speak to you about the management of pediatric hydrocephalus. My specialization here is in pediatric neurosurgery. I um, encourage you to ask uh, questions on Twitter using the hashtag, uh, as you can see here, hashtag UCLA MD chat. And I'll be able to answer uh, any of your questions after this uh, brief presentation. I have no conflicts of interest. So what is hydrocephalus? So hydrocephalus, um, if you break it down into two words, hydro um, is a Greek word um, meaning water, and cephalus means head. So in, in reality, in its most basic form, hydrocephalus really means uh, water in the head. And uh, what causes this increase uh, accumulation of water um, uh, in the brain is what we're going to talk about in the next few slides. But the, the cerebrospinal fluid, which is brain fluid, gets made continuously um, throughout the day. And also the body absorbs it continuously throughout the day. Whenever there's an imbalance, as in there's too much water being produced and not enough being absorbed, um, this can lead to a situation of hydrocephalus. Unfortunately for us as pediatric neurosurgeons, hydrocephalus is the most common um, um, condition that we treat. And um, uh, any pediatric neurosurgeon, about almost up to half um, of the operations that they do are for uh, hydrocephalus. So what is the function of the cerebrospinal fluid, or what we call brain fluid, or spine fluid? It's a clear, colorless fluid that circulates and really bathes the brain and the spinal cord. And it has several functions. First one it is, the first function is to cushion or act as a shock absorber for the brain. Second, it also functions by delivering nutrients to the brain and removing toxic waste away from the brain. As I was mentioning before, hydrocephalus um, affects um, almost so one or two uh, out of every thousand babies born are affected by this disorder. It's actually, again, the most common reason to see a pediatric neurosurgeon. Unfortunately, there is no cure for hydrocephalus. There are certain situations we will uh, get into later in the talk where um, if there's a discrete uh, cause of the hydrocephalus in which you're able to treat that, sometimes it can lead to a cure. But for the vast majority of the time, there is no cure. And unfortunately, there's no effective medical therapy. So the treatment of hydrocephalus is uh, only through surgical means. And we'll go through these uh, different types of uh, surgeries that we can perform for hydrocephalus. And lastly, it's important to note that hydrocephalus is often a lifelong condition. So in pediatric neurosurgery, um, often when we see a child with hydrocephalus, we would follow this child up throughout the duration of their childhood and on to early adulthood. So. Uh, this is something that, you know, it's, it's, it's not like you can get it treated once and um, not have to ever follow up with a neurosurgeon. So here's a, a brief anatomical representation of uh, the human brain. And the blue areas, as you can see here, represent what we call ventricles in the brain. So these are normal spaces in the brain that contain brain fluid or CSF. And, in, and I'll show you here, there's several ventricles. And each ventricle is a pocket of uh, brain fluid space. These two top ones are called the lateral ventricle. The middle one there is called the third ventricle. And down here is the fourth ventricle. And the fluid gets made in the lateral ventricles, travels to the third ventricle, and then travels to the fourth ventricle. Now, if there's any blockage of absorption of the brain fluid, what happens is that the volume of the fluid builds up. And as you can see on the right here, 
the ventricles are enlarging. And as it enlarges, it puts pressure on the brain. So this is the situation which we call uh, hydrocephalus. So hydrocephalus, you can break it down uh, into, there's three main ways that you can get hydrocephalus. One is if too much CSF is being produced. Two is if there's an obstruction in the fluid pathway so it can't drain how it normally drains. And thirdly is if you have an impairment in your absorption. So there's fluid that's being made and bathes the brain and the spinal cord eventually is absorbed by the, by, um, on the surface of the brain um, and the spinal cord and that fluid gets removed. So when that doesn't happen, that absorption doesn't happen, you get hydrocephalus. So in uh, pediatrics, we, have, we commonly use these growth charts. So every time you come to see a pediatric neurosurgeon, one of the most common things that we do uh, if your child is very little is we measure uh, the head, the head circumference. And the head circumference gives us very useful information because it can tell us if your child's head is growing more rapidly than expected. And one of the reasons why it may be growing more rapidly than expected is that because the fluid, the CSF, is accumulating in the brain. Now, in little children, they, their, their skull hasn't completely fused together. So they're soft, there's a soft spot on the top of the head here, which is, actually, which is called the anterior fontanelle, which, is, a, which uh, is an area that doesn't have any bony covering. So in children less than the age of 18 months, it is normal to have this soft spot. Now, if a child that's that young has hydrocephalus that's not treated, what may happen is that the skull, which normally fuses as we get older, it will, it will, it will not be able to fuse. So that soft spot will stay, remain open. So, that's, so by measuring the circumference of the head and also by our physical examination, and being able to examine the child, we'll be able to get an idea before we get any CT scans or MRIs or ultrasound whether uh, there may be evidence that there may be hydrocephalus. So in infants, um, infants present with hydrocephalus. Uh, very, there's many different ways that they can present with hydrocephalus. And generally, when we see uh, children, there's, there's three types of, um, there's three types of situations. One is that the child comes in very, very sick, and we know that there's a problem that we need to address right away. Second situation is a child is really, really well, and we know that there is no problem with hydrocephalus. And thirdly, and commonly, uh, in between where we, we have to see if the hydrocephalus or the fluid, the increased fluid in the head is attributed to how the child is presenting. So it can be quite variable and sometimes difficult to discern out. So that's why it's important um, to see a pediatric neurosurgeon who can uh, diagnose your child with hydrocephalus. Some of the more common ways infants present with hydrocephalus are the following. They can have an abnormally um, fast increase in their head size. We know the human skull doubles in size in the first six months of life and then doubles again within the first two years of life and by the end of two years the skull is about 90 percent the size of an adult person's uh, skull. But in children when, they, when their heads are growing too rapidly that's the first sign that there may be on underlying hydrocephalus. Infants can also present with either fussiness, irritability, drowsiness. They may not be feeding very well. They may be uh, vomiting their, uh, with their feeds. A lot of these things, uh, so, so with infants, it's very important to try to discern exactly what the cause of their symptoms are because these symptoms can also be present for a variety of different conditions. So it's important uh, to make sure that they are not due to hydrocephalus. Really young babies can often present with breath holding spells or their heart rate, heart rate may slow down 
intermittently. Also, another sign is if they have a very bulge, bulging, intense fontanelle, the anterior fontanelle in the front of the head, that may be a sign that there's hydrocephalus. In older children, it's a little bit easier because older children will often speak to us and tell us that they're, they're having a headache or they're not feeling well. They're, sometimes they have learning problems in school. They can have nausea. They can have vomiting. Uh, they can also present uh, and by being more drowsy than usual. Sometimes they have a loss of coordination and they have difficulty walking. And oftentimes we can see evidence of hydrocephalus as well by looking at the back of their eye with a fundoscope and we can see evidence of swelling at the back of the nerve that goes to the eye and that's a sign that there may be increased pressure in the head. When we think about hydrocephalus as pediatric neurosurgeons, we like to break it down into the cause of the hydrocephalus. So it's very important to try to figure out what caused the hydrocephalus because that can oftentimes dictate the best treatment for hydrocephalus. So we break it down into congenital causes of hydrocephalus and acquired causes. Congenital causes of hydrocephalus are those in which the child is born with hydrocephalus. So there's an underlying um, a congenital issue that led to, to the birth of this child with hydrocephalus as opposed to an acquired cause. An acquired cause is something that happens later in life that leads to hydrocephalus. Some of the more common uh, causes of hydrocephalus amongst many uh, in, uh, in acquired cases is prematurity. So this is the most common cause of hydrocephalus in North America is due to uh, babies being born prematurely. And the younger they're born, they're actually at, a, at an increased risk of bleeding into the brain and thus causing scarring, which leads to hydrocephalus. What the scarring does is that it, um, it doesn't allow for the reabsorption of the cerebrospinal fluid. The other causes of hydrocephalus uh, are infection. Sometimes you can have tumors that block the passage of the cerebrospinal fluid or the CSF and that can cause hydrocephalus. And other times you can have trauma that leads to hydrocephalus. So in terms of the most common causes of hydrocephalus in children in North America, if you look to your left, intraventricular hemorrhage. Hemorrhage means bleeding inside, so, and we're talking about bleeding inside the ventricle. The most common cause of this again is prematurity. So this makes up roughly 25% of the causes of hydrocephalus that we see. The second most common cause of hydrocephalus in North America is myelomeningocele. These are open neural tube defects where the spinal cord fails to seal off and close and this, um, the spinal cord ends up being outside the body and this causes problems with circulation of the cerebrospinal fluid which can then again lead to hydrocephalus. And as you can see in, in decreasing um, frequency after this we have tumors, we have aqueductal stenosis which I'll talk about a little bit later on, infection and head injury. So oftentimes when you see a pediatric neurosurgeon and after they're done um, getting a history or getting the story of what is wrong with your child and doing a brief physical examination which may include measuring the, the, the circumference of your child's head and plotting it and a re the rest of a full neurological exam. Oftentimes uh, your neurosurgeon would want to get an imaging study. Now if you're baby's very little and the skull hasn't completely fused closed yet, this is an excellent opportunity where we can use a brain ultrasound which doesn't have any radiation. We're able to get a, a picture of the brain uh, through the soft spot at the top of the head. So this can be quite informative. Now oftentimes if you have to go on to surgery or you need something done or if your child is not at that age where an ultrasound is feasible, 
you may have to have a CT scan or an MRI. So a CT scan, uh, the benefits of that is that it's quicker and it can give us a lot of information very quickly, but it does involve a small amount of radiation. An MRI scan can give us more detail, it takes longer, um, and oftentimes uh, when, if children are uncooperative, we cannot do this test without having to put them to sleep for the test, for the study. So these are some of the downsides of an MRI, but, but it does allow us uh, to get more meaningful pictures as well, it doesn't involve any radiation. So the choice of which study to do depends on the clinical situation and your child. Now oftentimes in clinic we see uh, occurrences of um, uh, fetal ventricular megaly. So these are uh, mothers that undergo an, ultra, uh, an ultrasound or maybe later an MRI during pregnancy um, for whatever reason and it shows that their child has large ventricles as you can see here and these ventricles in the brain contain this, the cerebrospinal fluid and here you see evidence of hydrocephalus. Now sometimes we're able to discern and figure out exactly what is leading, what is, what is causing this hydrocephalus but oftentimes we're not able to. Now it's very important to follow up with a neurosurgeon in these cases after birth in case a treatment needs to be performed uh, right away. Now there's a very important distinction that, that, I, that I hope I can get across today what, is that large ventricles on their own do not equate to hydrocephalus. So here's, there's two, um, here's two situations. On the left you see that the ventricles are quite large and it's causing pressure on the surrounding brain and not only we have um, an MRI here but we have to correlate this with what's happening in your child and see if we can explain the symptoms that your child is having with this MRI or the CT scan image that we have and if that correlates we call that hydrocephalus. On the right side here you see that the ventricles or the fluid spaces of the brain are large but they're not causing any pressure on the brain around it. In that case, we just call it ventricular megaly, which means large ventricles. Large ventricles on their own, if they're not causing any symptoms for your child, they do not, it does not need treatment. It's not hydrocephalus. We may choose, in this case, to follow your child along in clinic. There's another entity that I'll briefly talk about which often uh, is called hydrocephalus, but we don't think of it the same way as we think of traditional hydrocephalus. And this is something called benign external hydrocephalus. This is where there's increased fluid accumulation, which is the dark area here, surrounding the brain, and not really inside the ventricles, which are the dark areas inside the brain here. And this condition is usually self-limiting and it's extremely rare for it to require any medical intervention. These children commonly have heads that may be larger than normal and that's why they get sent to a neurosurgeon. But oftentimes by the age of two, this completely re resolves without the need for any surgical intervention. So in hydrocephalus, we have, uh, we have two main treatment goals. And our, our main goal here is to restore the normal pressure in the head. So we know that too much pressure on the growing and developing brain is not good for the brain. And the main way we try to uh, restore the normal pressure in the head is by either re-establishing the normal CSF flow. So if there's a blockage in the pathway of the CSF flow, by relieving the obstruction, we can, we can alleviate the hydrocephalus. And the second way we do this is by diverting the brain fluid to another part of the body that can absorb that fluid. Now more, co more commonly, that part of the body is the abdomen. 
where we drain the, the cerebrospinal fluid or the CSF into the abdomen. But we'll talk about that in the next uh, few slides. So the most common treatment for hydrocephalus is a shunt. And by a shunt, we mean a tube, as you can see here. This part of the tube goes into the ventricle, which is the fluid spaces of the brain. And it collects the brain fluid, goes through this valve mechanism, and then a long tube that goes down and tunneled, uh, is tunneled under the skin and enters the abdomen into the peritoneum, into the peritoneal space. And that's a large space in the abdomen that has the ability to absorb this extra brain fluid that's being made. So this is the most common operation that's done worldwide for hydrocephalus and one that's been around for a very, very long time. And this is a, a little cartoon that shows um, what this tube looks like and in terms of the incision that occurs the back of the head. So here you can see we make a small hole at the back of the head where the skull is, which is called a burr hole. And through this, we have access to the brain. And what we do is we pass a small catheter through this hole into the, ventri into the ventricle, which collects the cerebrospinal fluid, goes through the valve, and then again, under the skin, this goes all the way down the tubing into the abdomen. Now, sometimes there are situations where we cannot uh, divert the fluid to the abdomen. For example, you may ha the child may have an abdominal infection. So in those cases, we have to look for alternate sites to divert the cerebrospinal fluid. The two more common areas where we divert fluid when we can't access the abdomen is the pleural cavity, which is just outside the lung, and sometimes uh, into the heart, where we, where we drain the CSF into the bloodstream at the level of the heart. Now, whenever we talk about a VP shunt, or a ventricular peritoneal shunt, the common shunt that diverts fluid into the abdomen, one of the key questions that comes up is, what type of valve should we use? Now, valves work through different mechanisms. The most commonly used valve is something called a differential pressure valve. The way this valve works is whenever the pressure in the brain is above a certain threshold, this valve opens up and it allows the drainage of the fluid into the abdomen. We also have flow-regulated valves, which allow for a constant flow of spinal fluid into the abdomen, regardless of where the pressure may be. Thirdly, uh, we have anti-siphon devices. So, what, so one of the things that we always worry about is if the child stands up and the pressure difference between the head and the abdomen is quite large, that can cause a siphoning effect where too much brain fluid will be drained into the abdomen. In those cases, you can get fluid collections on top of the brain. So we have devices that allow for anti-siphoning, so it doesn't allow gravity to, to uh, exponentially increase the amount of fluid that gets drained. And lastly, and more commonly, uh, nowadays we use programmable valves. So these are valves where you can adjust the pressure um, through non-invasively just through over, over the skin and by changing the settings of the valve to high or low pressure you can influence the amount of cerebrospinal fluid that's drained into the abdomen. This is a, this is a simplification of these valve systems uh, but I want to present it to you so you are well informed about the different options when it comes to management of hydrocephalus and the different valves that we select. Now each one of these valves may be different, may be better in different circumstances. However, I want to bring your attention to this. It, you know, when we've done large studies to see if any particular valve is better than another valve, we have found that there's really been no difference. And these are three 
This is a randomized study. It's a large clinical trial where we have used different types of valves and to see which one lasts longer, meaning which valve can you, can you go the longest duration without having to have a repeat operation. And when you look at that, all three of these valves kind of, they actually fail at the same rate. So there's, there's no such thing as one valve being better than another. Now different pediatric neurosurgeons may have preferences for different situations. So it's important to speak to your pediatric neurosurgeon and consider specific situation when deciding which valve may be best for your child. So the other option that we sometimes employ in the treatment of pediatric hydrocephalus is uh, through an endoscopic treatment. So by endoscopy, what I mean is a camera inside the body. And here we're talking about a camera inside the brain. So as you can see here, this, uh, this is a camera that we can put in through a small burr hole, which is uh, you know, less than less than a centimeter hole on the skull, and we advance this endoscope into the ventricle and then into the third ventricle. And what we do here is we can poke a hole and create an opening within the brain that allows us to treat hydrocephalus without leaving an implantable device, such as a shunt. So whenever this is possible, and we, and we think that we have a good chance of success, pediatric neurosurgeons would often elect to use this procedure. Now, this procedure may not be feasible depending on the situation that your child is in. So it all, it's not, this is not something that can be offered in every situation of hydrocephalus. So here, as you can see in the bottom, this is our view where we look at what we call the floor of the third ventricle. So the bottom of the third ventricle, which is this line here, and we, make, we poke a hole, and then using a balloon, we dilate this hole. And this allows for the brain fluid to be able to circulate in a more normal fashion around the brain and be absorbed. But this, again, doesn't work in every situation. When we compare the endoscopic third ventriculostomy, which is a procedure I just talked about, with a shunt, and we look at the quality of life after this treatment, we see that really there's not much of a difference. The, the differences are minimal and could be just due to chance alone. So one treatment here isn't particularly much, much better than the other. So it's important to, again, consider the clinical situation when recommending either a shunt or endoscopic third ventriculostomy procedure. Nowadays, there's been significant interest in the addition of choroid plexus cauterization. And what I mean by the choroid plexus cauterization is that there's a, this, this red structure here is called the choroid plexus. And this is what is responsible for cre creating or producing the cerebrospinal fluid that leads to hydrocephalus. So there's been a renewed interest in being able to, through an endoscope, burn this tissue, the choroid plexus, and, and uh, decrease the amount of CSF production in the brain. And the thinking is that by not only doing the third ventriculostomy, but by also burning this tissue and decreasing the amount of CSF that's produced, you have a better chance of treating the hydrocephalus. Now, if you look at any study, whether it's a shunt or uh, endoscopic third ventriculostomy, or a choroid plexus cauterization with an endoscopic third ventriculostomy, you will see that the, this is what we call the shunt survival curve. So it shows how quickly our shunts fail. Our shunts, or our shunts or our ETVs are failing. And you can see there's about close to a 40 or 50% chance that the procedure that 
is done will result in a long-term freedom from the hydrocephalus. So no matter what treatment you elect, currently, 50% of the time, the treatment is not permanent. And we may have to do subsequent treatments. So in terms of these three different treatment options, there's, again, there's not one that's substantially much better than the other two. Now, one of the more common things, uh, question that we get asked in clinic is, what is, what is our ability to predict success with our procedure? So what we have now, we have a tool uh, called the ETV success score, where we um, consider the age of your child, the etiology or the cause of their hydrocephalus, as well as whether or not they've had a previous shunt. And using these three parameters, we can estimate the probability that your child will, will have a successful endoscopic third ventriculostomy. And by success here, I'm meaning a procedure that results in definitive treatment of the problem, where you don't need a subsequent surgery. And we have these tools available to us, which is really important for you to consider whenever you're in a pediatric neurosurgeon's office and they're suggesting for you to undergo this treatment. You want to know what is the probability that this treatment will be successful. We also have scales that have been produced for also um, utilizing the choroid plexus cauterization. Again, looking at the age, the cause of the problem, and also the degree to which we can cauterize the choroid plexus, we can estimate the likelihood that this treatment will be permanent. So what happens after you've had a procedure, such as a shunt, or a endoscopic third ventriculostomy, or a choroid plexus cauterization? So your child will commonly be monitored in hospital for at least a couple days just to make sure that the treatment is at least initially successful and that the fluid doesn't reaccumulate. What we would like to do after procedures like this is to continue monitoring the head circumference of your child to ensure that it doesn't continue to grow more rapidly than expected. We'd also obtain follow-up imaging in the form of a CT scan or an MRI to get a baseline for what the ventricles or the fluid spaces of the brain look like following treatment. This is important for us because if there's any subsequent problems where you may suspect that th the symptoms of your child is due to hydrocephalus, we have a scan for comparison and we'll be able to assess the size of the ventricles. Also, we would continue to track your child's developmental progress to make sure that your child is meeting the developmental milestones that are consistent with your child's age. The other thing we do, usually a couple weeks after surgery, is we bring you in to also monitor the incision site to make sure that there's no infection or there's no fluid accumulation there. So these are things that we do commonly after a shunt operation or an ETV operation. So shunts, unfortunately, just like endoscopic third ventriculostomies and cord plexus cauterizations, can fail. And they can fail as quickly as the same day. They can fail any time, really, in, in, a, in a child's life. So that's, that's, the, that's, that's where we need to get better with better technologies. But as what we have now, we have to always keep that in the back of our mind, that that, that shunt procedure that we did may fail in the future. And for that, it's really important to be attuned to the signs and symptoms of shunt malfunction, which commonly can occur with headaches, vomiting, drowsiness, restlessness. But, sh but shunts can really fail in a variety of different uh, ways. So it's really important for you to know your child well. And oftentimes, we rely on the parents for this because they know their child better than we know, we, know that, uh, we know their child. So we often rely to them to see if their behavior is normal or not, and, it, and is there any underlying cause for a shunt, uh, reason for a shunt malfunction. Now oftentimes, it's not clear right away whether the problem is the shunt or not. And, for, and in these situations, we oftentimes bring the child to hospital where we monitor them over the course of 
a day or several days. And sometimes that allows the uh, problem to manifest itself. And, we, and that way we can decipher whether it's really, it, it is the shunt or it's not the shunt. So prognosis in hydrocephalus, that's a very common uh, question that comes up. What is the prognosis? How will my child do after hydrocephalus? Now it's important to know just, just, you know, when I showed you earlier that there's many different causes to hydrocephalus, sometimes that's more important in driving the prognosis than the actual hydrocephalus itself. So it's more important to know what caused the hydrocephalus as opposed to um, the treatment of the hydrocephalus. Oftentimes we look at the thickness of the brain surrounding it and the thickness of the corpus callosum, which is the area of the brain that connects the two hemisphere. The thicker that is, the higher indication that the child will do well developmentally. And we also look at the other anomalies uh, in the brain. That can sometimes give us a clue as to the uh, future in terms of uh, developmental outcome. Ultimately, even though we have several parameters, it is extremely difficult and no one really has the crystal ball to be able to say how your child will do in five to ten years. And these are the studies that we're currently doing to be able to better assess the, the, the prognosis of your child's hydrocephalus. And it's really important when we look at the current literature as to what um, as, as to what we're calling successful, and I use the word success several times today, the literature that we have equates success to whether or not you need another uh, shunt operation. And there's a lot of controversy as to if that should be our marker of success. The more important uh, marker of success, I believe, should be the quality of life for the child, the neuropsychological development, the education, the jobs, social interactions, and not just the number of shunt operations. Now, I'm going to briefly go through a few scenarios um, where, um, you know, you know when, whenever you have a scenario, I think you should spend the time to go through with your pediatric neurosurgeon to see why they're suggesting what they're suggesting and really be involved in that joint decision-making process to determine what the best next step is for your child. So for example, so in the top case of progressive hydrocephalus where the ventricles are getting larger and larger and the child continues to have symptoms, that's easy. That's where you need to intervene and treat the hydrocephalus. In the second case scenario, if you have ventriculomegaly, which is just large ventricles, on their own without any signs of pressure and your child is doing well, in those situations you may choose just to watch and there's no need to do any operation in those cases. Now if you have, a, if you have hydrocephalus due to a tumor, so if there's a tumor that's obstructing the pathway of the fluid, oftentimes if it's surgically accessible and possible, removing the tumor will relieve the obstruction on the fluid spaces of the brain and allow the hydrocephalus to resolve. Now there's a situation I didn't talk much, uh, about much uh, prior is arrested hydrocephalus and that's when the ventricles grow to a certain proportion and then they stabilize and they don't continue to get bigger. So some people call this a stage of arrested hydrocephalus and it can be quite controversial what to do here. What I would recommend in a situation of arrested hydrocephalus is to continue watching the child very closely from both a neurological perspective and a developmental perspective to see if you have any evidence that the child is not meeting their milestones. And if they're not meeting their milestones and there's reason to believe that it may be due to the underlying hydrocephalus, in those cases I would recommend treatment. Rapid onset hydrocephalus is something that can be life-threatening and some, some children present this way and it's, and it's very important no matter where your child goes to, the emergency room, the pediatrician, any doctor be able to recognize this and refer your child to a pediatric neurosurgery facility as soon as possible. This is, this is something that we can treat if we get to your child early enough. So it's very important. So if your child
the most common reason why kids present this way is a rapid buildup of fluid in their brain. And oftentimes, they could be drowsy, not responsive, vomiting several, several times. Um, so, so whenever you have a constellation of these symptoms, it's very important to, to go to a facility that has pediatric neurosurgery. And lastly, in the case of in utero hydrocephalus, now we commonly don't treat hydrocephalus in utero before the child's born, but this is a situation where you want to follow your child, the baby closely with the neurosurgeon. So after birth, we can, we can see your child, assess your child, and see whether there's a need for treatment at that time. So in conclusion, uh, I mean, hydrocephalus is a, is a vast, vast topic, and each situation is very different. And although it's simply defined as the buildup of too much fluid, it's actually a very it's deceptively a very complex disorder. And each decision needs to be made on an individual basis. And there's, there's branches of hydrocephalus that I didn't even um, talk about today. Um, but it, it's very important to, to discuss, um, discuss your child in a specific scenario with your neurosurgeon very closely to figure out what the best treatment is going forward. Again, careful consideration of the cause of the hydrocephalus is very important. And oftentimes, neurosurgeons will ask you, what is the reason why your child has hydrocephalus? What that initial cause of the hydrocephalus is? So it's really important to remember that, to convey that, because that can influence the management of your child. And ultimately, I strongly believe that becoming well informed in the disease process to treatment options will allow you to make good decisions in conjunction with your pediatric neurosurgeon and ultimately affect the prognosis and outcome of your child with hydrocephalus. I thank you for your time. I look forward to answering uh, your questions on uh, UCLA MD chat. So the first question I have here is, how early can hydrocephalus be diagnosed? And that's a very question. So, so it depends on the cause of the hydrocephalus. I showed, I showed you a situation where the hydrocephalus can actually be even diagnosed in utero. Now these are, these are the cases of congenital hydrocephalus, where hydrocephalus um, presents in the child at the time of birth, or even before birth. And in cases of acquired hydrocephalus, where hydrocephalus occurs later, maybe due to a tumor or bleeding inside the brain due to uh, whether it's trauma or a blood vessel that ruptured, those cases happen later in life. But as soon as, the, as, soon as you have hydrocephalus, we have the imaging capabilities to be able to detect it uh, through, uh, through either ultrasound, a CT scan, or MRI. Are there genetic factors which can cause hydrocephalus? Yes, there are. One of the more common ones is the X-linked disorder that is linked to hydrocephalus. So there's, there's actually several genetic um, causes of hydrocephalus. So one of the other important things that sometimes should be considered is whether you need a referral to a geneticist to be able to test for these and see if sometimes you have a genetic trait in the family that's being passed down and causing hydrocephalus. What literature can I read about hydrocephalus? So there's um, uh, one, of the th one of the great websites for, um, uh, to be able to rely on for information regarding hydrocephalus is the Hydrocephalus uh, Network. So I would Google that. I don't have the, I don't have the link right here. But uh, that would be a great uh, resource. There's hydrocephalus networks. There's researchers that are interested in um, um, improving the treatment options we have for hydrocephalus. And those websites commonly carry uh, a, a good amount of useful information that's actually geared towards the patient. And you can always also visit our website at UCLA uh, Neurosurgery. We have information there also regarding hydrocephalus. And also, if there's any specific questions that you have, be able to direct it to the website, and I'll be able to answer you from there. Thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure being here.
Thank you.